Um, so, as mentioned, my name is David. Um, hopefully you can tell by the lightning bolt. I work on Messenger at, at Facebook. Um, been there about a year and a half. Um, before that, I actually worked uh, for Deep uh, at LinkedIn. That was actually my previous uh, product role. I was there about five and a half years. Um, been there since the company was about 10, 15 PM, saw it grow, had my career change also from an IC to uh, manager of PMs. And, and so um, over the years, I've done a lot of chance to you know, coach, mentor a lot of PMs on my team, other parts of the team, um, outside some mentoring, advising at uh, 500 Startups, which is where I met Carlos, which is, he said something nice about me this morning. Um, and so I end up telling a lot of the same things and tell a lot of the same stories. And um, they end up being kind of a similar set of lessons. So, I thought I'd go through some of the lessons I've learned in my career. There's about nine of them, um, and all of them would have a, a story with them, and hopefully some of them are new or at the very least entertaining stories. So with that, um, so one of the things that uh, I learned kind of early on in my career was that uh, PMs generally have a very data-driven engineering background. What does that mean? You're close to the product. You're close to the data. And so you're very pessimistic about like, what's going to happen. So every product spec comes out, and you're like, OK, this is my new feature. And then like, here are all the ways I'm going to drive people to use it. And that usually is a pretty good idea. But a lot of PMs, including myself, often don't think about is like, well, what happens if people actually use your product? Is it actually going to work really well? Uh, and so the story for me, as I mentioned earlier in my career, is one of my first uh, product features that I was working on was uh, at LinkedIn was the endorsements feature. So if you're familiar, you um, endorse a connection for having, um, being awesome in a good skill or area of expertise. Um, and so when we came out with it, we were like, great, this is going to be a really lightweight way. People are going to like it. Um, and uh, what we'll do is we'll make it a really cool visual. We'll say, look, when you go to someone's profile, you probably want to know what they're skilled at. And so we'll make this nice visual. It'll be like a bar chart where like, your top skill, you'll see like, you know, what do you endorse for all the way to the bottom. And as a bar chart, we're a social network. We'll use faces of people. So it'll be a cool row of faces, and it'll look really great. Um, and people will really like it. Um, and of course, no one would ever get more than 10 endorsements for a skill, so it would be a really good visual. And that would work out really super well. Um, and if you ever follow the product, or probably a lot of you have used LinkedIn, and you go to people's profile now, um, actually not now, because they changed a few years ago, which is great, um, which is you got a block of faces. That was what the product experience was for everyone. So I launched this product, and it was just not what I had actually designed for. I actually designed for a case of like, oh, there will be slow uptake. And instead, it was actually a very viral product. And so the design actually didn't accommodate success. It accommodated failure. And so that's one of the things is as you think about your product features um, when you're thinking on, obviously you want to think about how you can make sure they're successful. But if they are successful, does it actually work in scale? And so it's something that, honestly, I need to remind myself a lot um, and think about. So this is probably a phrase a lot of people have heard um, either this phrase or something very similar to it, which is strong opinions loosely held. Um, and so uh, if I ever have a PM on my team where they come on, I just tell them that they can't be successful as a PM without having a really strong opinion. Right? The team is looking to you to define what is the goal. What are we going to do? What's the roadmap? Which is, in essence, a strategy for getting to that goal. Um, and so the PMs that come in and don't really have that, they just can't be successful. That's what the team is counting on them for. Uh, at the same time, the reverse is also true. If you have that really strong opinion, then you go in and like, users tell you otherwise, or the data tell you otherwise, you should probably change your opinion. Um, and it's hard to fall in both these traps. And so one of the stories from, from my time was um, I started on Messenger, um, and um, I was working on search to help find businesses and people um, in Messenger. And so I came in, and my job was to make search better, like make, it, make the search better quality, help people find what they're looking for faster and better. And so we went in, and um, we had a hypothesis that actually the biggest thing we could do to improve search was make ranking better. Um, we had some like kind of input from internally of like, hey, like you know, people aren't ranked really what I expect them to be, and like that's we can fix that. And so we're like, oh, this is great. We'll go fix that. Um, it'll be better. And so we put in some data in there and metrics, but then also we started running some experiments on on ranking. Um, and what we ended up learning as we went through was the biggest lever we had and what ended up making people find their, what they're looking for more successfully was actually latency. The speed of actually getting search results ended up being a bigger lever. Of course, ranking is important, but actually if we could provide those results super, super fast, that was actually going to be a bigger uh, impact. And so we went into the very strong opinion. We're going to go after a bunch of ranking stuff. As soon as we learned that, we kind of shifted a little bit and spent a little more time on getting fast results. So uh, I encourage that of PMs that I work with of you have to have a strong opinion, but then also as soon as some you know, something tells you otherwise, the data otherwise, it's okay to switch. It's, a, it's important to be able to do that. So um, 
one of the things that I look for for um, PMs that join my team, one of the criteria I think are really important for being a successful PM is the ability to be adjustable, to adapt. Um, and the way I think about it is this. So as a PM, you're probably coming into a team, probably is like five, ten engineers, maybe the designer, et cetera. And so you can come in one of two ways. You can come in and be like, this is my style. This is how I work. I'm like a waterfall or agile or something like that. Um, or there's probably an engineering manager who has a team of 10 engineers who probably take on that personality of that engineering manager. And you can adjust to what they're doing. So what's easier? You come in and you impose your way on the team and try to convince a bunch of people to, to work like you. Or maybe you adjust yourself. And it sounds logical and it sounds like, why wouldn't you do that? But that was actually one of the lessons I learned uh, in a pretty tough way um, in my time at LinkedIn. Um, so um, one of my times at LinkedIn, we were doing a redesign of the mobile app that we launched several years ago. And I was leading uh, a big part of it that had to interact with a lot of other parts of, of the redesign. And so uh, I had a new engineering manager, and he was great. And I came in, and I was like, great, so we need to ship this. We need to kind of all be aligned together, because like, that's how you release a big mobile app redesign. Uh, when are we going to have different parts done? And he was like, uh, no, we're not doing that. We're, we're, we're doing, I just want Agile. So we'll, let's figure it out. We'll have a backlog uh, if you're working Agile. Whatever we're doing for the next two weeks, we'll do there. And then we'll see, like, oh, is that good? And then we'll work on these features. And then at some point, we'll be like, that's ready to ship. And I was like, what the hell? Like, I need to actually like, update the rest of the org. Like, half the org is working on this thing. And you're just telling me we don't know when we're going to ship and what we're going to do. Uh, we're not going to work well together. Um, and literally for months, the first couple, two, three months of working with this engineering manager, we just did not get along. And that's really hard, because you know, obviously, if you're a PM, your engineering manager and your relationship is probably the most important. And so I kept pushing at it, I kept pushing at him, and finally I was like, look, I'll try it. I'll learn like, this agile thing that you're talking about, I'll try to adapt my style, and I'll take care of the communication, and like, we'll figure it out. Um, and it turns out he really appreciated that. He really went out of his way to thank me for that. The team was a lot happier. They were motivated. Um, and he really appreciated the fact that I would adjust my style. And it was great for me. I got to learn new product management style. But then also, he actually started to adjust a little bit. He's like, oh, yeah, we kind of do need to communicate. have a little bit of a sense of where we're going because the org actually depends on us. We're a pretty big org at that time. Um, and so what ended up happening was not only did we end up being successful and working well together, but actually that's one of my best engineering manager relationships for several years at LinkedIn um, that I've had in my career. And so... You know, in looking for, for teams that you're joining when you're joining, the best thing you can do, in my opinion, as a PM is adjust to whatever the team needs. And so that was a lesson that was a hard lesson for me, um, but I really liked learning. So. so as you think about your career in product, um, and this happened kind of uh, early in my career at LinkedIn, um, so things were going well. I was really happy. I was working on the profile. Had a good manager. People thought I was pretty cool, which is great. Um, and uh, there came this opportunity to join this new mobile team of like two or three PMs. And it was really small. There wasn't much traffic at LinkedIn on mobile. If you remember like five, six years ago, like most of you were probably using LinkedIn on the desktop if you were using it. Uh, and there was a small little team. Um, and I was like, well, that seems really cool. Like, I mean, obviously looking back now, of course, mobile's bigger. I'm working on a product now that's basically all mobile. Um, but, you know, at the same time, um, it wasn't that obvious back then, especially within the business. And so when I looked at going to it, people thought I was a little bit nuts. You're successful now. My manager's like, why would you want to leave? You have a new manager. Why would you take this chance? Um, and yet for me, it was like, look, I think this is going to be a big area. I think this is going to be important. And I want to get there sooner than everyone else because I want to actually become an expert, at least in the company within mobile. There wasn't that many people who really understood mobile development, you know, mobile UX patterns, um, specifics to the OS, how people actually use the product on mobile, which is very different than desktop. And I wanted to become an expert because I was like, look, there's all these great PMs here. How can I differentiate myself? And I'm sure you guys are thinking about that. There's all these great PMs here and otherwise, and probably listening. How do you differentiate what you're good at? And for me, it was, I want to be a mobile expert within LinkedIn. Um, and so I made this transition, um, and it wasn't that straightforward that it would be good for my career. But at the end of the day, obviously mobile grew at LinkedIn, and I was one of the few people who understood early on within the product org what was unique about mobile, what do we need to change, how you know, do we need to change our design. And so for me, that's the advice is when people ask me about, you know, what should I do next or should I transition, it's what do you think the big trend is? What do you want to become an expert in because you think it's trending, and how can you differentiate yourself? And for me, that was that time at LinkedIn, and it ended up being great for my career. So um, definitely something. Um, so when I think about also creating a product team, and, and not just a PM team, but also a cross-functional team, one of the things I found is that it's really important to actually have a diverse team to actually create good products. 
So when you're founding a startup or you're maybe working early on in a product, generally, especially on the consumer side, your first product user that you're thinking of is you, right? It's easy to design a product for you. You're great at understanding what you want. Um, but when you start thinking about products that grow, especially even, you know, both enterprise products and consumer products, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, billions of people, there is no way that you can say, well, my, my experience is the way everyone is going to experience it. Yeah, that's your tendency as a product manager. And so the way I found to get over that is by having people with diverse backgrounds around you who are going to have a different experience and different perspective on the product than you do. So uh, I told a lot of these who have a story with it. So one of them for me was... Um, one of the PMs of my team was working on a feature called uh, message requests on Messenger. So it's when you like send a message to someone that's not your contact, Facebook friend. We're like, hey, do you want to actually talk to this person, yes or no? Um, and when we were building it, it turned out that this person actually had a relative that was actually relatively famous and did get a lot of message requests. And that was really helpful to have because, you know, at the end of the day, you don't really know what that experience is like. What is that kind of person going to want? Do they want to be reached? Do they not want to be reached? What cases do they want to reach? And so a lot of the features that we came up with around filtering out ones that you might not want to or might be spammy, giving you controls to ignore, delete, whatever it may be, that came out of actually a lot of his experience of having someone who had this kind of experience. And so from my point of view, it had been really hard for me to come up with a great product experience for that kind of use case, which, again, when you have this many people who are using your product, it's actually millions of people, even if it's an edge case. So it's really important. So that's kind of what I think about as a product manager. Your job is to think about all these use cases. The best thing, way you can come up with solving for those use cases is to have people who have that diverse background. So it's really, really important. Um, and then as you do scale your product team, um, both from, again, a cross-functional and PM side, um, I think it's really important to surround yourself with people who compliment you. So a lot of us have certain strengths that we're awesome at. And the way we overcome our weaknesses is we try to improve them. And that's really awesome. I really think it's important to do. Um, at the same time, um, one of the other things you could do is put people around you whose weaknesses maybe complement your strengths and vice versa. So something for me, so um, one of the things that doesn't actually come naturally to me is motivating an entire group of people. So hopefully I'm doing that today. But if not, it's not something that actually comes really naturally to me. It's something I've tried to improve and will continue to try to improve. And it's very important for a product manager, as you might expect, to kind of have that. But at the same time, another thing you could do is surround yourself with people who are awesome at doing that. So PM on my team today, who's here and awesome, he will go into a room and get people excited about what he's working on. No matter what, they just like leave the room and they're like, we have to do this. This is the most amazing thing ever. I have an engineering manager counterpart that I work with who, when I work on big projects, he's like, I'm going to get up in front and be the rah-rah person. That's what he loves doing. And it's not as natural for me. When we were re redesigning the LinkedIn iPad app, um, it was really exciting. I was really pumped by it. But at the same time, having an engineering manager who would just get up there and be like, I want to see the latest designs. I want to show them. I want to show the cool things we're working on. It was great because I didn't actually always have to do it. And where someone, as you know, if it's not a strength of yours, it's something that takes a lot of energy. And so this is something you can do in addition to try to improving areas that you want to be stronger is surround yourself with people who actually are good and strong at those areas. And that way you can also uh, accentuate your strengths. So another thing as you scale your product team that I found really valuable and maybe more unique to myself is that um, I don't usually worry about the background people have. They're smart, they're excited, they're working on it. This is not 100% true. There are very unique roles where you do need that. Um, but in general, I think this actually gives me uh, an upper hand when I recruit people, is if I find someone who's smart and passionate and wants to work, I just take a chance on them. And more often than not, it works. And again, it's because product management is a discipline of many functions. And so generally having an exact background is not necessarily that important, especially is like given the fact that we're, a lot of us are working on stuff, especially in the consumer space, that is like completely different from five years ago, right? I'm working on Messenger, I don't think like, I mean, that product was completely different five years ago. It was a desktop product, right? You were doing it through like Facebook chat windows and now you have an app. It's completely different. Things change so often. So how can you possibly say you need like 10 years of experience in messaging? It's like, dude, that doesn't really exist. So um, actually the, the story that, or the thing that happened actually um, me, reinforced it with me was actually someone took a chance on me. So um, my first manager at Messenger, uh, I came in, I thought I was going to like work on like, um, you know, products that, you know, I've kind of worked on on LinkedIn and it was going to be really great. And he's like, yeah, go, uh, can you go help us on search? as I told you. And I was like, no, I didn't work for Google. I can't help you on search. Please find someone else. Um, and he's like, no, you'll, you'll figure it out. We have faith. And I was like, okay. Um, and so what I did, what I did other times, I went through, tried to understand, you know, what data do we have? What user information do we have? Try running some experiments, try to understand the user flows. And as I mentioned before, we kind of figured it out. 
um, and the search quality did improve. And it was something where someone took a chance on me. I have no search background. I'm definitely not the prototypical search hire. But at the same time, someone thought I was smart and excited, and so it ended up working out. And so I think as you think about scaling your product teams, you know, if you err toward just finding smart, passionate people, I think a lot of the time it'll work out, and it helps you then increase the pool of people you can uh, recruit from. So as you do scale your product team, um, you need to do it thoughtfully and make sure your team's set up for success. So what this means to me is you have to really understand the stage of the product and feature set you have. So it kind of ranges in two different ways, right? So one of the times you hire a PM is when your product maybe has a little bit of a roadmap and you have a bunch of engineers and they're just blocked because they're like, well, where's the spec, man? Like, come on. And you're like, I, I don't know. I don't have enough time to work on that. So maybe you're the CEO hiring your first product manager. Maybe you're the first PM of newsfeed. You're like, hey, like Facebook newsfeed's getting pretty big. Maybe we should hire a second person to kind of help out a little bit. Um, and that's like kind of one way. And of course, that's really nice because no PM uh, here or ever, ever I've met wants to be a PM where there's no engineers to work with because then like, what are you doing? Um, but at the same time, that doesn't always work. So you have to also understand is your product in a place where it has a roadmap or where it kind of needs a plan and a strategy. So you can also set up your team for failure when you're like, here's a bunch of engineers to go work on an area that has no plan, no strategy. And so you have to understand, is your area something that needs a plan, needs a strategy, need to think about how we're going to do things, and you don't want to just have a bunch of engineers work on stuff, and you're like, six months later, hey, wait, that was the wrong thing. So when you scale out your product team, there's various times you want to bring a product manager in, and you have to understand what you're looking for in the success of that product manager, and therefore determine when is the right time to bring them in. Um, and especially that happens, obviously, at big companies when you're asking for headcount and stuff like that. It's like, well, what are you actually doing? So you want to make sure they don't have any, no engineers, um, unless it's a unique situation. But also, if you have a bunch of engineers ready to work on something that doesn't exist, um, no one's going to be very happy. No one's going to be set up for success. So this is my final one, uh, because as I mentioned, I was at LinkedIn for five and a half years. Super happy. It's a great place to work. Um, and you know, I transitioned to Messenger, and so that's obviously a big change in my career, and I get a lot of questions about it, even though I've now not been there for a year, year and a half. Um, and it boils down to this. So whenever you leave a company, by the way, you'll find that a bunch of people come to you and are like, should I leave too? Like, what, what's going on? Like, should I make a transition? Um, and what I ask people and I found is the people who are happiest really know what they're looking for in their career, and that's how they're thinking about the transition. Maybe it's not the whole career, because like, I don't know what I'm going to do in 20 years, but they kind of have a sense of what are they looking for from their next role. When you don't have that, you're kind of just hopping to the next hot thing, and you may not be happy. And I've seen a lot of people go jump, and like a year later, they're back to where they were or something like that, and they're not really happy. And so for me, that boils down to really understanding that. And as I mentioned, when you're at somewhere for five and a half years, which is, of course, an eternity in the valley, um, and, you, and you make a move, it's, it's, it takes a lot. And I wasn't looking to leave LinkedIn. I was pretty happy. I'd done well. I had a team of great PMs, great cross-functional partners, and EM I talked to you about that we didn't get along, and now we were super best buds. Um, and yet, there came an opportunity to, to work on this product feature of, of Messenger that had you know, a billion people using it. Um, and I was like, well, when am I going to work on a product like that in my career? And if you probably heard from me, I love working on products that people use all the time. And I was like, well, what do you use more than messaging? Like, that seems really, really exciting. Um, and so I was really intrigued, um, even though I wasn't really looking. But the role they had open was an IC role. And people were like, what are you doing? Like, you just became a manager. You're doing great. People love that. And all they had, that's what they had open. And for me, it was like, look, this is what I want to do. I want to work on a product that, you know, has a smaller team. Um, you know, as I mentioned, LinkedIn had grown from 10, 15 PMs when I started to 100, 100 and however many. Um, and yet Messenger was in the kind of similar, smaller state. I was like, I want to be a part of that. I want to see where it goes. I really feel like I can actually shape the trajectory of this product. And on top of that, like the ratio of like PM and engineer to actual like number of people using it was like pretty off the charts. So I was like, look, this is what I want to do. I'm going to figure out a way to make it happen. I'll take whatever role they, they offer me and I'll go for it. Um, and I found that for people who really know what they want to look for from their next role um, and they just want to make it happen, it kind of works out for them. And that was what it happened for me is I came on, did some good stuff. Search worked out okay. I took on some more areas, uh, moved back to a manager role. And for me, it's just been an awesome experience to um, be a part of you know, shaping that kind of product you know, and shaping the trajectory of this kind of product. So for me, that was the time to make a career change. And so what I would say to you guys is as you're looking for your next role, not only for a PM role, um, but just any role. Maybe you're already PM. Maybe you're looking to become a PM. Know why you're looking for it. Know what you're looking for. And that will really help you figure out if you're going to be happy at the next place versus taking it on. Um, and then, of course... As a plug, if you're actually happy and want to take on Messenger, because I just like, convince you of it, then come find me and talk to me. So 
with that. Thank you guys.